Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Implement High Throughput 3D Image Analysis for Samples from Subcellular Structures to Steroids, presented by Oksana Serenko, Ph.D., and Stephen Luke. We're excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Molecular Devices. Molecular Devices is one of the world's leading providers of high-performance bioanalytical measurement systems, software, and consumables, and is dedicated to helping customers unravel the complexity of biological system. Included within a broad product portfolio are platforms for high throughput screening, genomic and cellular analysis, colony selection, and microplate detection. These innovative instruments combine with scientific expertise, assays, and analytics tools for protein and cell biology enable scientists to explore life's most important questions. To learn more about molecular devices, please visit www.moleculardevices.com. I'm Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you'll be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. And finally, if you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window, or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. Thank you. Before we hear from the presenters, I would like to introduce Grisha Chandy, PhD, Senior Product Manager at Molecular Devices. Hi, everybody. I'm Grisha Chandy, Product Manager of Cellular Imaging here at Molecular Devices. I'm extremely excited to have you join our webinar discussing the implementation of high-throughput 3D image analysis for spheroids as well as subcellular structures. I'm going to go over an overview of how you do high-content screening, what that means, and how the ImageExpress Micro and MedExpress software packages fit into that workflow. And then we'll turn it over to Oksana, who will be reviewing a couple of very exciting screens of spheroids done in 3D, uh, so 3D data out of those screens. And then Steve, who will be discussing how you set up a 3D assay for subcellular structures. And then we should have some time for a Q&A. High content screening or high content imaging is, is an aspect of automated imaging. Uh, the process with a conventional microscope might be to put your slides on a, on a manual microscope or a semi-automated semi microscope with an automated stage, or maybe some automated focusing. You acquire some images, and then what? How do you make sense of that? Uh, those, those images that you collected, you need to piece together some software and analysis routines, maybe write some scripts, and that can, all of this workflow can typically take hours. Now with high content screening, you can acquire the wide variety of assays as you saw build with that stack. You can acquire that those different applications from slides, from six wall dishes, from 3D4, from 15 6 wall plates. You acquire it fast at very high throughputs. You have image analysis that can happen uh, at this in parallel or in the same time as acquisition. And you can turn those numeric data into meaningful results. complete solution for image imaging starts with acquiring your images and for 3D data you will be acquiring Z stacks of data. The data will be acquired in Z. You want to identify objects, you want to do that image analysis which Steve Luke will be showing you some examples of. Um, and you want to do that in 3D space not just 2D. You want to turn those images whether they're 2D or 3D into multi-parameter data output. You want to get a number of measurements out of out of your images, and we'll be talking about how you do uh, 3D counting, 3D segmentation, 
3D volume and distance measurements. And then you want to make sense of all those numbers in this automate in this uh, overall um, high content workflow. Make sense of the data, uh, either hit finding or EC fifties, as examples. Molecular device provides a complete solution for that imaging workflow, starting at the top of your screen with the Image Express systems, which I'll talk to you a little bit about in the next slide. It's you have a data management solution that's automatically part of that workflow that uh, that the images go into. MedExpress automatically talks to that, that, that data management solution, MDC Store, puts the measurements that are made on those images into that same, same location, and then you have a way to data mine that with the QD Express. Molecular Devices products enable hundreds of automated imaging applications. All of these things, these assays are being done by some of our customers. We like to say we enable apoptosis to zebrafish. You've got a biological problem, we can solve that in an automated workflow for, um, for you. Uh, angiogenesis uh, is an example. Co-culture assays. Major gel cell culture assays. Very uh, complicated 3D uh, assays to be able to quantify that. Mitochondrial localization, we'll see a little bit of a mitochondrial assay in Steve stock stem cells, stem cell assays, and zebrafish assays. So from apoptosis to zebrafish are uh, things that people do with our products and we try to enable those and make them easier and faster. We enable these hundreds of applications with a portfolio of intelligent imaging solutions that allows you to do breakthrough research. The Image Express Micro XLS is a proven product recognized in the high content imaging space. Our newest offering is the Image Express Micro 4, which we've just released, which takes the best features and benefits of the Image Express Micro um, and brings that to market along with the ability to be field upgradable confocal. So you, it allows you to grow with your needs. And the Image Express Micro confocal product, which we launched at the end of last year, is a product that's ideal for the, some of the 3D assays we'll be speaking about. The other enabling tool is Men Express, which is not only runs the Image Express systems, but is also the Image Analysis Toolbox. You can do turnkey applications uh, with application modules, things like neuroid outgrowth and cell cycle and all the way on the continuum of increasing flexibility and complexity to uh, the running uh, journals, which are our macros, which are enable powerful um, hardware, software decision uh, making um, as part of the automated workflow. This webinar is gonna focus on custom modules, which is something that bridges the gap between application modules and macros um, that once you've written an, a custom module, it can be rerun as an application module. Uh, talking to you about how you do 3D application modules, but in the past, we've these, these custom modules have enabled things like mitotic, spindle, and centrosome detection, uh, label-free proliferation assays, uh, not just neuroid outgrowth, but identifying puncta on your neurites and, um, and even in migration assays. So on that note, I will turn it over to Oksana, who will uh, be um, uh, talking to you about uh, some of the 3D assays she's done on spheroids. Thank you, Dr. Chandy. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Oksana Serenko, research scientist and Stephen Luke, applications scientist, both from molecular devices. Oksana is working on development of new technologies for imaging and high content analysis. She has prior experience working on drug discovery and drug development at several biotech companies in the San Francisco Bay Area. The focus of her current scientific research is on development methods for high throughput in vitro toxicity screening, including 3D models. Oksana has a PhD in biochemistry and bachelor's degree in biology. 
Stephen is working as a customer representative for the high content screening software team. He has a bachelor's degree in biology from Niagara University and more than 10 years of experience in high content analysis and cellular imaging, starting in the field as a core imaging facility manager at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. Please join me in welcoming Oksana Serenko. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Hello, thank you everyone for joining our webinar. I will be happy to present our studies about phenotypic characterization of compound effects on liver spheroids using confocal imaging and 3D image analysis. This work was done in collaboration with Cellular Dynamics International. Cell models becoming more complex in order to better mimic in vitro environment and provide more biologically relevant systems for drug discovery and toxicity testing. There is increasing interest in exploring three-dimensional spheroids for modeling development and tissue biology. Accordingly, development of higher throughput assay using 3D cultures is active area of investigation. The goal of this study was to develop and evaluate high-content imaging methods to investigate toxicity effects on the morphology of liver spheroids using techniques for confocal imaging and 3D image analysis. Induced pluripotent stem cells uh, derived hepatocytes present a valuable model that can closely resemble the phenotypes and functionality of primary hepatocytes and also minimize variability and other limitations. We've used iPSC-derived hepatocytes from Cellular Dynamics International for this study. Scientists from Cellular Dynamics, Michael Hancock and Kobe Carlson, developed a protocol for cell culture and formation spheroids. I-cell hepatocytes were preplated first in the 6 well format, then after 7 days plated into the low attachment in sphero or corneal plates. Formation of spheroids was observed in 48 hours. Then spheroids were treated with compounds known to have liver toxicity for 72 hours. After that, live spheroids were stained with calcium AM, first etidium homodimer or other dyes. Spheroids were imaged using molecular devices Image Express Microconfocal instrument. Images were analyzed using 2D or 3D image analysis to define phenotypic readouts, which include morphological changes of spheroids as well as intensities and also count of different cell types. We use previously developed staining protocol and concentration and one-step dye addition that eliminates the need for fixing cells or repeated wash steps. You can see here images of representative spheroids stained with a mixture of three dyes. Calcium AM was used to measure cell metabolic activity, viability, and variety of morphological parameters. Hurst was used to measure total cell count and nuclear shape, and a tedium homodimer was used to mark dead or necrotic cells. Here presented composite images of spheroids treated with compounds known to have liver toxicity. You can see phenotypic changes as a result of compound treatment. Common issues for 3D imaging described by others include efficiency of light penetration into the dense object, like spheroids, also light scattering by cells and high background from out-of-plane fluorescence. These issues tend to be less important for smaller spheroids, like used in present study. Confocal microscopy provides efficient background rejection and sharper images. In this study, images were taken using automated confocal microscope with a large field of view camera. The system effectively captures spheroid in a single image using 10x objective. At this magnification, we typically took from 11 to 17 images, 5 micron or more in distance. Images acquired with 20x objective provided even better visualization of details. 
In the present study, 3D analysis of images was accomplished using recently added features of MetaExpress software. This software converts a stack of 2D images obtained by confocal acquisition into 3D space with appropriate detection and segmentation of objects. Spheroids can be characterized by their size and also intensities. On the graph, you can see measurements characterizing spheroid as a single object. You can see spheroid treated with methyl mercury is different in size because of toxicity-induced loss of spheroid integrity. And also, you can see decreased viability staining, like intensity for FITSI channel. Individual cells and subcellular objects can be analyzed and characterized within spheroids. Custom model editor typically used for the analysis. The analysis included cell scoring for defining cells, nuclei or cytoplasm, positive or negative for selective markers. On this slide you can see segmentation of cytoplasm. And here you can see analysis masks. Cell scoring analysis allow to define spheroid objects in light blue, also live cells shown in yellow, dead cells shown in blue, and cytoplasm positive for calcine AM in pink. Here we present an individual Z planes. Individual Z planes were first segmented and analyzed as 2D images for example, for nuclear count or cell scoring features. Then the objects were connected by best match function with user-defined maximum that allowed for displacement of each object relative to another object. For example, about 5 microns for the maximum displacement for the nuclei and 20 microns for cytoplasm. Nuclei or individual cells were segmented and scored in a contents of layered 3D volume, ideally without missing objects or counting the same object twice. These steps allow defining and counting the number of total cells, number of calcium positive or negative cells, number of etidium homodimer positive and negative cells. In addition, the intensities of individual cells can be defined in different colors, as well as the volumes, diameters, distances between the objects. The larger spheroid mask can be used to define number of smaller objects within spheroid or externally. Significant changes in spheroid phenotypes and cell content were seen after treatment with hepatotoxic compounds. Many spheroids lose their spherical shape, appear disintegrated, loose or flattened or irregular, have cells detached from the main body, or show condensed nuclei due to cell death. Quantitative analysis of images include finding parameters that allow assess morphological features of spheroids and also their content and complexity. The volume, diameter, and intensities were measured, and also the number of calcium positive cells as live, the number of etidium homodimer cells as dead, and also average volumes and intensities of cells positive for these markers. Concentration-dependent decrease in a number of viable cells was observed as a result of compound treatment, and also increase in a number of dead cells. Average fluorescent intensity for calcium was dramatically reduced for entire spheroid and also for individual cells. The average volume of cytoplasm stained with calcium was also decreased. The number of metabolically active calcium positive cells, the volume of positive cells or the fluorescent intensity provided the greatest sensitivity. Spheroid diameter, volume, or count of dead cells changed significantly, but typically did not follow four parametric concentration-dependent responses. In contrast, the number of live cells, as well as calcium intensity or volume of calcium positive cells, resulted in significant assay windows and successful fit into four parametric dose-response curves. 
For the study of cytotoxicity mechanism, we also evaluated apoptosis and mitochondria integrity. Activation of apoptosis using caspase 37 dye was measured 24 hours after compound treatment. You can see typical activated caspase staining pattern for cells treated with methyl mercury. Mitochondria potential was evaluated with mitotracker orange dye. You can see decrease in stain for spheroids treated with antimycin A. Spheroid assay was characterized using a representative set of about 50 compounds that included known cytotoxic and hepatotoxic agents, plus six chemicals considered safe or non-toxic. Table here presents selected set of hepatotoxic compounds, known liver toxins like aflatoxins and rotenone, methylmercury, anti-cancer drugs like mitomycin, doxorubicin, antidepressants like haloperidol and other types of drugs. We also compared effects for selected compounds on spheroids made from transformed liver cells. Hep 2 spheroids were larger in size, per same cell number plated, since Hep 2 spheroids appear to continuously grow in a culture during compound treatment. Also, there was marked decrease in the size of Hep 2 spheroids, as well as decrease in the total cell number, which was in contrast to the not dividing I-cell hepatocyte spheroids. A comparison of IC50 values for compounds between two cell types is given in a table. There are significant differences between the two cell models with respect to antiproliferative compounds. The IC50s for HEPG2 were in nanomolar range, whereas IC50s for hepatocyte spheroids were significantly right shifted. In contrast, for majority of hepatotoxic compounds that don't inhibit replication, for example, ketoconazole, showed similar effects in both cell models. In a summary, 3D spheroid cell model combined with high-content 3D assay show promise as a sensitive and reproducible screening tool for assessing hepatotoxicity. And while in vivo toxicity assessment remains the gold standard, 3D models can accelerate the process by allowing rapid compound prioritization for in vivo testing and establishing mechanism of action. In addition, I would like to briefly describe another model. Similar approach was taken for imaging and analysis of spheroids in semi-solid media. Images were acquired using confocal option. These slices were captured 5 to 10 micron apart. Several Z planes presented here show how the focus changes for different objects when moving in 3D dimension. Analysis allowed defining cells in different images and then connecting those in 3D space. Custom model allowed count and characterization of individual spheroids and also count numbers of live and dead cells within spheroids. Compound treatment resulted in decreased numbers and size of colonies and also decrease of the number of live cells and total cells. 3D analysis links the object in different Z-planes and also enables characterization and morphometric analysis of spheroids in 3D. You can see concentration-dependent effects and four-parameter curve fits for selected compounds. The number of spheroids, number of live cells, total number of cells, number of live cells per spheroids, all those readouts have a good fit into four-parameter curve. I would like to acknowledge scientists from Cellular Dynamics International, Michael Hancock, Kobe Carlson, and David Mann for their contribution for this project, and also scientists from Molecular Devices, especially Trisha Mitlo for technical help and others for development of instrumentation and software. If you have additional questions about cell culture protocols or staining, imaging or analysis, 
please contact myself or David Mann at Molecular Devices or Cellular Dynamics. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Oks Thank you Oksana. Three poll questions will appear on your screen. Please select your answers then close the poll questions by clicking on the X in the right corner. Thank you. I will now turn the presentation over to Stephen Luke. Three D analysis can be added to different scales of samples. Oksana is talking to us today about relatively large samples, multicellular analysis and spheroids. Her presentation will also be a scientific discussion on the benefits of 3D analysis. I will cover a different set of material, concentrating on subcellular analysis, and rather than a scientific presentation, I will discuss how you might approach building a volume module. This is the set of wells acting as a backdrop for making the module. It is a simple toxicity assay with retinone and 1 to 10 dilutions and a control well. These are some of the sample images. The control treatment is on the bottom left showing healthy stringy mitochondria. And the five micromolar concentration of retinone images are on the top right showing clumpy mitochondria. It is important to note that for some assays you can create pretty simple modules to get a measurement to classify cells one way or another. For example, if all we needed to do was have a module which detects the toxicity of a treatment based on mitochondria, then rather than create a set of masks segmenting mitochondria, the module could just create a mask that covers all the mitochondria and measures the intensity variation under that mask. Intensity variation is a texture measurement where clumpy mitochondria have fewer, smaller, brighter spots and so have a higher variation than those that have long, stringy, relatively dim mitochondria. For this presentation, and in the spirit of high content, we'll use a more in-depth module that can give us uh, more values, like volume of mitochondria or the ratio of stringy to clumpy mitochondria. 3D data can mean different things depending on what is acquired. And there are different ways you can segment data based on what you want to get out of it. The first and most obvious approach is to work with objects as volumes. You can take advantage of the three-dimensional nature of the data to better filter, process, and classify the objects. In this pattern, you take source images, which are just two-dimensional planes acquired at va various focal planes, and you analyze them together as a unit and you use dedicated 3D processing steps to do so. And the next approach is to process each plane individually as two-dimensional data. Then when done processing in 2D, you combine the results into volumes using various connection rules. This allows you to use any of the wide variety of 2D processing steps that are available while still resulting in volume objects at the result side. Finally, your 3D data may just be a combination of 2D planes without any real connection between them, so you can analyze them plane by plane without introducing any 3D requirements. For example, if your sample is a tissue with z-steps much larger than the size of the objects being analyzed, or for 3D-based migration assays, where you just need to track cells moving from the top to the bottom of your membrane. This is the custom module editor. As a quick introduction to the user interface, on the left side of the window, you'll see a series of step cards, each of which is a processing step which, which are strung together in sequences to form the module. At the top of the window is the ribbon with buttons to add step cards to the module. The arrow points to a group of step cards that are dedicated for 3D analysis. On the right side of the, is a slider that you can use to choose a Z-plane to view in the image grid. 
At the bottom is a film strip which shows a thumbnail for the results of each step. And on the last slide, I talked about a third approach to 3D images where you can basically treat the data as just a bunch of 2D images. To do that, you can turn this option off. Processing images in 3D can take time based on the number of images you have. This section allows you to crop the images in X, Y, and Z, which makes creating the module faster, but still allows you to run the module on the complete image when it's time to do so. So let's look at the first part of our module, finding nuclei. To do this, we will segment entirely in three dimensions. To begin, let's look at the DAPI source image. DAPI can be quite textured, especially with confocal source images. So to ensure that we segment the image well, we will first use a 3D average filter to smooth out the sample. With the nuclei smooth, it is time to segment. Again, we will use a 3D tool. This one is designed to find spherical objects. It is capable of finding things a little more complex than spheroids, but generally it's good for things where the centroid remains roughly the same from plane to plane. This is one of two step cards designed for 3D segmentation. The other, Find Fast 3D Objects, allows some rougher shapes, but Find Spherical Objects does a better job of finding bunched together things sitting on top of each other. The result of the segmentation is a cell map. A cell map is a colorful mask where each individual nuclei is represented by a color. As you navigate through Z, the objects remain the same color. Now we process the source image, then segmented processed image. This is a good point to review our source and our segmentation to make sure the segmentation looks correct. To do that, use the Compare Images step card and choose the original source image and the result of the segmentation. You can also open the images up in the 3D viewer to make sure the shapes look correct as volume. The next thing we need to do is segment out the mitochondria, and if possible, differentiate between healthy and unhealthy mitochondria. The, unhealthy, the healthy mitochondria are long tubes, and neither of the 3D segmentation steps work well with tubes, so it is a good time to switch to the second approach to finding 3D volumes. Segment the images in 2D, then connect the 2D segments into 3D volumes. This gives us access to a lot more segmentation options. For this module, we will use angiogenesis objects. Angiogenesis is a good tool for finding tubes, which is great for the healthy mitochondria. But it also attracts nodes, which makes for a great mask detecting unhealthy, clumpy mitochondria. Before we run angiogenesis, though, we will add a pre-processing step. We want to separate and highlight relatively small structures from blur or smear. The LOG filter, or Laplacian or Gaussian filter, is a great tool for this. With LOG used to highlight the mitochondria, it is time to run angiogenesis. Angiogenesis produces four masks. The first is a mask of the tubes, which we will be using for the healthy mitochondria. The second is called nodes, which is what we're going to use for clumpy mitochondria. The other two are a line along the center of the tubes and a dot at the center of each node, and we won't be using them for, these, for this module. Angiogenesis produces two-dimensional masks. Our module requires volumes, so we need to connect the 2D masks into 3D volume maps. There are three connection rules to help with this. Do not connect objects generates a 3D volume map without actually connecting objects. Good for the when, when the objects are smaller than the C-step, but you still want to accumulate results in 3D. 
Connect by best match connects objects on neighboring planes in a one-to-one -one basis. It is best to use this when you know your objects have no branching or tree-like structures. For our module, we will use connect by touching, which connects objects on a many-to-many -many basis, allowing for complex structures and branching. We have the mass that we really need to make the measurements we want from the module now, but we need one more mask as the apparent to enclose all the mitochondria and the nuclei for the cell. There are different strategies to do this, depending upon what you need to get out of the module. We have a good nuclei mask, so we could define a cell as those pixels in and around the nuclei, which would look like this. Or we could create a more complete mask that segments all of the important pixels both nuclei and mitochondria together to generate a cell mask, which would look like this. For our module, since we are using numbers generated by specific masks for the nuclei and the mitochondria, we could use the first approach without much, much of an issue. And we, could, and we would prefer doing it this way, since it is much quicker, and this module is long enough as it is. But in the beginning of this talk, we mentioned about a uh, we mentioned a single mask that we could generate and measure intensity variance as a stand-in texture measurement that we could use if we didn't need volumes or other high content numbers. To get that measurement, we would need the second more accurate cell mask. And so for this presentation, I will quickly walk you through the generation of this more complete mask. To start generating the cell map, we will first combine the nuclei and the mitochondria into a single image to make it easier to find all the pixels we care about. We will then blur the image with a dilate to smudge out the details so that we can connect masks. And then we will segment the smudged cell pixels into a binary mask. How you do this is dependent on a lot of the dependent a lot on the quality of your images. For this set, we can use a simple threshold, but there are other options to get the complex shape that you may need. What is important here is to get all the pixels that you care about, not necessarily to split the individual cells yet. After we have our mask, we will add a filter to get rid of the little things that come from noise or debris. In this example, we'll remove any objects which don't at some point touch the nucleus. The result will be our cell pixels, all the pixels that will be part of one cell or another. Splitting the cells is the next big hurdle. To do that, we'll use watershed lines for which we need to gather two intermediaries, a representation of the nuclei we can use as a marker to generate exactly one cell per nuclei, and a second to generate intensity peaks between the larger cell pixel objects. We will start with this second image. The intensity peaks will come from the distance map, an image where we will take each pixel's intensity as a measure the distance from the edge of the object. We'll use it in the cell pixels mask to get the intensity peaks we need. Then, to generate the nuclei markers, we will add three steps. The nuclei volume mask has the objects we need, but isn't binary, and the nuclei which are next to each other don't have an empty pixel between them, so we will trace the edges of the nuclei and cut those edges out of the volume mask, and in the process turn the nuclei volume into binary markers. With the nuclei markers in place, we have what we need for watershed lines. Watershed lines will trace lines along peak intensities and will be sure to draw a line between every pair of neighboring marker objects. We combine that result with cell pixels and we have our 2D cell mask. Since this is a volume module, we will combine the 2D masks into 3D volume maps using connection rule 
And this time, since we expect a one-to-one -one connection from plane to plane, we will use connect by best match. The final step is to define what gets measured, what numbers to generate. To do that, we switch to the measurements tab, select our cell volume map as the object mask, and then proceed to add additional feature masks for each thing within the cell that we want to measure, namely the nuclei, stringy mitochondria, and clumpy mitochondria. Assign which images to measure and which or with which mask. We can select which measurements to make for each mask and image. For example, for the cell volume mask and the mitochondria source image, we can measure the intensity variation to get that one single measurement I have described a few times now. Then we can add and name additional measurements for each of the other masks until we have the set that we want. We can run the module and look at the result mask. Measurements per cell and ensure that we have the numbers and the masks that we need. Once we save the module, we can save once we have the module, we can save it. And once saved, we can run it from MetaExpress or MetaExpress PowerCore to generate the numbers over a plate. I hope this helps you build your own three-dimensional analysis and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Oksana and Stephen, for the informative presentation. Some poll questions will appear on your screen. Please select your answers, then close the poll questions by clicking on the X in the right corner. Thank you. It's time for Q&A. If you have a question you would like to ask Oksana or Stephen, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen, and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Dr. Chandy will now moderate the Q&A. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, there are quite a few questions. I'm going to try and um, group some of the questions that are similar together. Uh, there are three questions around, um, for Oksana around how the um, assay and cells were grown and done. So I'm going to read each of the three questions and then Oksana will answer them all together. Uh, excuse me. Uh, there was one question about how the cells are, whatever plate is used and how the cells are centered in the plate. Um, let me just... Uh, Maybe she can answer, oh yeah, can you image in a 96 cell plate in an automated fashion? On a low binding plate, the spirit may not be at the same x y position. How can you get the, uh, you know, the, 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 the spheroid centered? Um, and why don't you answer those while I look for the other questions that are similar? Hello. Hello, thank you so much for your questions. So I will be happy to answer. In fact, indeed, uh, centering spheroids uh, for imaging and automatic imaging is kind of very uh, important uh, um, uh, point. And actually, we are able to mitigate it by using two types of plates. So one type of plate is in sphero U-shape, low attachment plates. They come either in a, um, kind of in a 96 format or 384 format. Those are from Cornian. And another type is in sphero plates. They are 96 format. They have flat bottom, but they have conical well, so that flat part is very narrow. So in both cases, uh, because we have like large uh, um, field of view camera, we able with um, no problem cover uh, all steroid in any location of the well uh, in um, 10x magnification. For 20x magnification, it's also possible in automated fashion when we use in corneal plate, which kind of uh, this U shape allow steroid actually to be centered in a well, so which allow to capture entire object without splitting. Um, yeah, so that answers that question. So there's another question about um, whether you can um, image um, spheroids over time in the system. 
Yes, actually, sure. We have done these studies. We actually monitor formation of steroid and the kind of acute effect of some drugs. So you can do it by using time lapse. So you set up like maybe 20 minutes um, lapse or uh, um, to do overnight experiment and you can monitor formation of steroids in real time. And, and then um, there's a question that I'll just answer, which is, were these, you know, what system were these done in? These were all done in the Image Express microconfocal product. Uh, she sets up the assay um, and then puts the plate in the system. You can do that with a robot or by hand. And then the, the system is run. And uh, you can do them either as an endpoint assay, like, like presented this presentation, or as she mentioned, as a, a time lapse. Can you discuss, a, a different question is, can you discuss a little bit about your staining procedure and uh, how, you know, how you added the dyes and um, whether you removed them and things like that? Mm -hmm. This is another kind of important topic because those steroids are kind of not attached to the bottom. There are some challenges for staining and washing. So the protocol which we develop actually include just single step addition of dyes. So usually we add like 3x concentrated dye mix in PBS directly to, to the wells without uh, removal media or anything. And uh, we allow like uh, at least two hours for staining. We usually keep during uh, these two hours plates back to incubator. And with those dyes which we use, it's kind of sufficient to penetrate inside steroids. And we don't wash. And die out, so we just image it directly. So this confocal system, it has very nice background rejection, so it's not a problem at all. Um, so uh, I remember, so the, on the, there's another question on the, uh, the time lapse. I remember that uh, one of the uh, data you published was on just doing um, cells and sphere formation over time without a stain. Have you also done it with stains? We've done the live cell measurement with stains? Uh, we have not done it, but uh, it is um, possible, yes. So it's just kind of the matter of to choose the right dye so it wouldn't fade away or it wouldn't cause toxicity. I would imagine that this kind of yeah, whole cell stain dyes could be useful for this purpose. Or maybe if you use the, uh, first stain in a lower concentration, it's also kind of an okay option. Uh, question for Steve. These are two related questions. Uh, are there tools available to estimate uh, cell or sphere location or distribution in, in 3D analysis, uh, distribution from uh, cell, cells or other spheroids? And then there's the, the direct question is, can you, make, uh, can you perform distance measurements in 3D? So those two questions, I think, are a little bit related. Steve, can you take that? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, the custom module it does let you measure positional information, X, Y, and Z position. There is a measurement for each object that is the distance to its nearest neighbor. So that gives you dispersion measurements. And then there's also a measurement that you can make on um, there's a 3D distance map. So you can have distance of one object from some common source or from something in a different channel or a different type of object. Uh, here's a question that I'll take. Uh, can the software analyze images from other images other than the Image Express? Yes, we have ways to import um, uh, data from third-party uh, imagers. Uh, we haven't, you know, there's a limited uh, set of instruments we've tested it on, so it really depends on the format of the data, whether we can import it or not. Um, and we've, we've done it with some, uh, both competitor and collaborator uh, instruments. So it, uh, it really depends on what you have. Um, sorry, let me go back and look at the questions again. Steve, a question for you on um, how long um, uh, 
3D analysis in a 3D full wall plate would might take? Okay. So that depends a lot on the module. There's um, simple modules like we were talking about, that single mask that you could use to measure the uh, variation under. That can take just a few minutes, three to five minutes per three to four well plate. And then uh, something that's a little bit more robust like that, the, the whole mitochondrial volume, um, if you have lots of uh, Z-planes, that could take upwards of, I'm sorry, um, that three minutes per plate, three hours per plate. The, the big one could take a, you know, 30 hours. You, you, it's a big investment of time. Yeah. There's also Meta Express Power Core, which can then speed up the analysis time by distributing the analysis around to different computers. And you're looking at maybe reducing the three hour quick module down to 45 minutes and taking that um, 30 hour down to maybe five hours. Yeah, you can maybe get a, a sometimes maybe a 10x improvement, so maybe three or four hours. Right. Um, and, and there's a question. There's a question, I'm just go back to Oksana. Uh, did you use air or water or oil objectives for your assays? Actually, it was all air objective, yeah. No oil in this assay. Uh, Steve, uh, what are the three connection rules again? Okay. The three connection rules? There's a, um, a do not connect objects. This one creates a volume map but does not connect uh, objects from one plane to another. So it's very good for when you have, like, let's say, nuclei in your spheroid. The nuclei might not actually appear on multiple Z planes, but you still want to count the number through Z. And so this would allow you to accumulate data through 3, 3D without actually connecting anything. The second rule is connect by touching. So if there's any overlapping pixels from one plane to the next, they're going to be connected as a single object in three dimensions. And then the third one is connect by best match. And this is going to be a one-to-one -one connection from one plane to the next. And it's going to use size and position to determine what object to connect. If there's more than one that might possibly connect, it'll determine the best match based on size and position. Um, Steve, there's a question on uh, whether you uh, need a confocal system or actually it sounds like a customer has our existing image access micro XL. Um, can you do these analyses in both wide field or confocal mode? You can do them in wide field mode. You don't need the confocal. The confocal will give you improved segmentation because um, it's removing a lot of the out of focus light. And then the depth or the 3D size of the object um, might be extended, so it might be measured as deeper and the volume overestimated in a wide field system. But it's still possible to segment in both wide field and, three, and confocal. Okay, thanks, Steve. Uh, there's a couple questions about uh, if this webinar is going to be available. It, it, uh, I think they've been answered uh, privately, but they will, it will be available, and we'll uh, let the attendees um, uh, know when it is posted, um, and it's usually within less than two weeks. It, it should you should be notified about its availability. Um, actually, there's a question. I'm going to get, uh, have Oksana uh, answer it. Have you done uh, much uh, uh, immunostaining of the spheroids? Uh huh. So I've uh, tried staining of six. Steroids, but with phalloidine only. I um, uh, didn't try to uh, stain for some um, other markers yet. Um, it should be possible, but it may be uh, some issues with antibody penetration, but uh, we have not addressed it yet. It's in the future. Uh, I'm going to take this question. Uh, the question is, is the 20th the highest method? magnification that this process can handle, what's the maximum amount of mag at which images can be processed. There's no limit on magnification for images to be processed. I think uh, for Oxana's assays, um, there was a benefit of 
uh, of the plate she was using and the spheroid size and things like that to do it at, at you know, 10 or 20x, but the, the software doesn't care about uh, magnification. Um, I'm not sure, Steve, was, was the mitochondrial assay uh, taken at 20 or 40x? I believe these ones were 60x. 60x, okay. Yeah. So that's, so that, yeah, that's, it really depends on the assay and what you're trying to see, what mag and what objective you would use. Um, uh, it just happens that Oxanas were done at lower mag. Um, So, Oksana, uh, did you do any normalization of your calcium live cell uh, signal to um, number of nuclei per spheroid or anything like that? In fact, it was done automatically because the numbers were uh, kind of I choose to be reported were average intensities of uh, cell cytoplasm. So I can either get um, average value per well, or I can get um, individual intensities of individual cells. It is also possible to get um, uh, other intensity measurements, like um, integrated intensity or intensity of um, entire steroid as an object. Oksana, uh, did you compare the behavior of compounds in 2D or 3D, uh, and what were the results? Uh, yes, we have done this uh, study. So a set of compound was compared for hepatocytes in 3D system and also compared with our previous data done in 2D system with the same cells and um, kind of a, a similar protocol. So cells were kind of treated for 72 hours and then stained for viability markers and then analyzed by using cell scoring for live or dead cells. Uh, so with this um, kind of similar approaches, we were able to get IC50s for number of compounds and for number of compounds, they were kind of uh, comparable, but for uh, the um, number of other compounds, it was different. So one example was uh, paclitaxel or haloperidol. We get uh, much smaller IC50s for 3D system. Another question for Oksana. Have you tried spheroids from other uh, cell types or organs other than the iPSC-derived hepatocytes and the FG2? Uh, actually, we've published last year a paper on using kind of um, uh, steroid assay for testing anti-cancer drug using HCT116, so this color carcinoma cells, and it was actually working very robustly. Uh, also, we were using different cell types from uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, so we have done uh, studies with uh, cardiomyocytes, and it was actually really fascinating assay because we were able to record beating of those um, cardiomyocyte steroids in a, in a culture and monitor that. Um, which readouts from the 3 NAS, 3 NAS are best for determining IC50s? What had the best sort of uh, Z primes and assay windows? Mm -hmm. So we have done some studies on the topic. So if for the present study where uh, these hepatocytes were not proliferating, the best readout was the number of live cells. Steroid, but also other kind of good readouts, which had a very large assay window and uh, low variability, where uh, uh, cytoplasm volume, either uh, uh, average per cell or total per steroid, as well as average cell intensity. Those were kind of very good markers for IC50s. Some other uh, uh, readouts, uh, for example, size of steroid or diameter or um, uh, intensity of entire steroid or uh, uh, number of dead cells uh, was um, having 
um, significant as a window, but much smaller than that other which I described, and IC50 core fit was very poor. Uh, did you already answer this question? Uh, apologies if I, I asked already. How was compound treatment performed was for 72 exposure, a daily dose uh -huh. changing fresh compound every 24 hours? Yes, actually for 72 assay, <coughs> we were kind of not, we didn't re-add compounds during the assay, but it is possible to do if you kind of choose so. In our previous studies where we did five-day incubation for these cancer steroids, so we added compounds once during this incubation, like on a day three. Okay, I'm, uh, we're at the hour. Um, we, there, I'm, I know I did not get to all the questions, apologies. So if you want to uh, contact us directly, please do so. Um, our, our email address is firstname.lastname at moldev.com. Uh, you can learn more about um, our product uh, at uh, our website, www.molecularDevices.com. We'll let the attendees and registrants know about uh, this webinar directly by, by email. Um, and, uh, but for those who don't get an email, we will usually uh, host something on our, either our website or on LabRoot's website for some time uh, so that you can uh, uh, review this webinar. And we also have a, another place to stay in touch uh, is um, we have a software forum, um, metamorph.monothodevices.com, where we have both, um, uh, you know, modules and questions that can be answered about, um, about both Metamorph and MedExpress. And it's an open forum, and it's peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, so that's another resource uh, for you to learn more about our product. Um, I will just take one more quick look at the Q&A to see if there's no... Uh, other key questions, and um, I think it's slowed down. So again, thank you for your attendance, and I'll turn it over to um, back to Labroots and Judy. Thank, thank you. you. I would like to once again thank Oksana Serenko and Stephen Luke for their presentations. Do you have any final comments? Uh, yes, I really appreciate for all the people who join and um, kind of I uh, try to answer many questions, but please don't hesitate to email me additional questions you have. So we would like to further develop these techniques. And if you have questions about uh, uh, cells, uh, so please contact Cellular Dynamics. And if you have a question about software, Steve Luke would be the best person to answer. Did you have any closing thoughts? I, w I would also like to thank everybody for their attendance. Um, and yeah, feel free to contact me if you have questions. Thank you. Thank you both again. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Molecular Devices, for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through November 24, 2016. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye. <laughs>